Okay, so we are now recording. So um, if you just entered, maybe you didn't hear me announce it, but my name is Sam Harlow and I'm the online learning librarian as well as the liaison librarian for kinesiology, public health education, and community and therapeutic recreation for UNCG University Libraries. UNCG Libraries um, came up with the idea to create a series of webinars for the UNCG community on anything to do with research and applications, usually hosted by librarians. So welcome to the series. We've been doing it now for years, but I will say this has been our, um, a very popular topic. So in this series, different librarians will cover topics on UNCG libraries and resources and research tools. There are 30 minutes and recorded in, it used to be WebEx meetings, but now we're in Zoom and placed on the library webpage through YouTube where they are eventually closed captions and not have participant data available for the public. So um, all of the past webinars, if you're interested, because some people on this um, signed up for the uh, other webinars that have happened. All of the past webinars that have happened have been recorded on there. So I'll try to send you all those recordings, but we did just recently add in a recording for next week, which I'll talk about at the end on researcher identity management hosted by Anna Craft. So um, I'm just gonna cover a couple of logistical things before we begin. You were muted upon entry, but please remain muted during the presentation um, by making sure that the audio icon, the microphone icon next to your name is red. It's also located at the bottom left of your screen. If you want to exit out of the present, the full mode of the presentation, you can just click escape on your computer and then you will have access to the chat as well as see other participants. Uh, if you do not have a microphone, you are also welcome to participate in the chat. And then throughout the chat, if you have any questions, please put them in there. If there are any technical issues, you are welcome to email me. I'm about to throw my email in the chat. Um, but do remember that this is being recorded. So worst case scenario, we'll get you the recording on the back end. So are there any um, questions as I introduce Amy? Okay. So today's topic is on APA 7, the final frontier, um, as you see on your screen. Um, it's hosted by Amy harris Halk, the head of research outreach and instruction, as well as the School of Education librarian, as well as human developmental studies, right? Human development and family studies. Human development and family studies. Sorry, I didn't want to forget them. So <laughs> meet myself and Amy, you can get started. Thank you. All right, thank you all for coming today. So yes, I'm Amy, librarian for the School of Education, um, and we're gonna talk about APA 7 today. So just so you know, um, before we get started, so the seventh edition of APA, or the manual, at least for the seventh edition of APA came out back in October. Um, yes, October, mid-semester. Um, a lot of us had questions about that when it happened. So um, because of the timing, most likely, people are still kind of transitioning or starting to think about transitioning from APA 6 to APA 7. So um, some departments on campus are, have already made the switch. Um, some are planning to do it over the summer. Um, so this is just an opportunity to give you a quick overview of the major changes that um, have happened between APA 6 and APA 7. The good news, I think, is that overall, it's much more streamlined and easier to use than APA 6. So that's the good news. I'll share that with you first. Um, so I'm gonna cover this in sort of three main sections. The first one is um, guidelines for formatting papers in APA 7. Um, then I'm gonna talk about um, in-text citations and then finally um, references and bibliographies. So those are sort of the three areas that I'm going to talk about today. Um, and I will tell you that, um, of course, I'm doing this from home. Um, but one of the things that I grabbed as I was, you know, gathering my things for an amount of time to be determined um, to be away from my office, I did actually grab my copy of the APA 7 manual. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. And actually, um, I've also learned of another way to access it. So I'm happy to um, answer any questions that you have about APA 7 because I've spent a good deal of time learning about it, as you'll see. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, guidelines for formatting papers. Um, as you know, 
um, APA is more and other citation styles are more than just references and bibliographies. There's a whole style for, um, for, you know, how you create a manuscript and things like that. So we're going to talk about that first. Um, so the first thing that I'll tell you may come as a surprise to you, and that is now it is official one space after all periods. Some of you may be wondering, why is that only official now? What a great question. Um, so according to APA 6, we were supposed to um, still use two spaces after each period in the body of your um, work, but the um, in your references and bibliographies, the initials were only supposed to have one period after them. I did not realize that. Um, and I like maybe many others have been doing one space after a period for a while now, but now it is APA official, hooray. Um, let's see, so just one thing to know. The other thing that I'm pretty excited about is what I'm calling font freedom. Um, before there was one, they suggested using Times New Roman, um, and that was it. Now they have a variety of fonts because they acknowledge that, um, you know, due to adaptive technology folks can change fonts and change the appearances of fonts to make them look however they want um, so now there's a list of uh, fonts that are considered appropriate um, by apa um, i am a fan of calibri because it is the default in word and i don't have to change it um, the one exception that they've made is that if you're using figures in your manuscript you the the description of the figure should be in a serif font why? I have no idea at all. Um, also, they say that computer code should be in a monospace font, um, so one of the fonts where each character is the same width. Um, but, you know, and they suggested a few, but there's not one standard font for computer code. Um, I do regret to inform you that this super cool font up at the top of my um, slides where the titles are, it's called Megram, Megram is not one of the allowed fonts. So I apologize for that. Um, it is super cool, but unfortunately not sanctioned by APA. Of course, you know, individual journals and publishers will have font requirements, but if you're just going by what is um, recommended or allowed, I guess, by APA, um, the list has gotten a lot bigger. So that's pretty exciting. Um, also, this is more for students. There's a new student title page, and I won't talk too much about this today, but um, you know, I've seen in working with a lot of students, students struggle to kind of uh, try to fit their assignment parameters into a, uh, the manuscript title page. Um, so they have changed that for students. Um, this is what it looks like. It's a little small, but you'll see the recording later. So you can see you've got the title, you've got the author or author's um, department and school, um, course, professor, and date. So um, it simplifies things for students. And you'll also notice up at the top the absence of a running head. So the running head is not required for the student title page. For those of us who are preparing manuscripts though, the running head still exists, but it's simpler now. Um, and the main difference, actually the only difference is that you don't have to use the word running head on the first page of your document. So pre in previous editions and APA 6, um, the first page had to say running head colon and then whatever your running head is. Now, each page will just have the actual running head without the words running head, if that makes sense. Um, and that actually makes things a lot easier because it's easier to set up headers on your paper when every single page is the same. So that's pretty exciting. I think you don't have to go in and set one, the first page with one running head and then subsequent pages with a different one. So way to go APA. This is one of the things that I was talking about when I said that it's more streamlined. Okay. Now we can talk about a little bit about in-text citations. Again, I think these are simpler and more streamlined than in the previous edition. There we go. 
So now, anytime there are three or more authors, your in-text citation will just have the first author listed. And in APA 6, this was true. So in APA 6, you had to list them all in the first one, I think up to six or seven. Um, and then the future one said, had the et all or however you pronounce that. Um, now, all instances of in-text citations for three or more authors will contain that. Two authors looks the same. Three authors will always look like this example here. So again, um, it what that does is it gives you shorter in-text citations, so they're less disruptive um, to the reader. So that's really nice. Um, there may have to be additional considerations if you have multiple authors um, or you're using multiple papers by the same author that have multiple authors. There we go. That was confusing. Um, so, but we can we can talk about that. Um, one thing actually that I really like about the manual itself is that, um, and I don't know again how much time you all have spent with previous editions of the APA Style Guide. Maybe not as much as me. I don't know. Um, but one thing that's really nice about the actual publication manual itself is that now for each example of a citation there's a corresponding in-text citation example. Um, so if you, you know, if you need to see how to cite a work with a certain number of authors or something like that, it will give you a corresponding in-text citation, which the sixth edition did not do. Um, so that is really helpful. So that actually is the main difference between um, in-text citations in the sixth edition and seventh edition is just that, um, lack of having to list all the authors for the first in in instance of an in-text citation. Um, let me check on that. I Hold on, I have my book. Oh, and also I will point out that, oh my goodness, you're right. Wow, let me fix that. Um, on this, Sorry, I'm fixing this on the fly. Um, there, did I fix it over here? Should have, hold on. Oh, hold on, let me bring that back in. Sorry, let me share my screen again. I just wanted to, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you, look at that. Thank you very much. I've looked at this a bunch of times and just missed that. Um, sorry about that. So, but I will point out that um, the page numbers are on all of these slides. If you want to go back, of course, these pages refer to the seventh edition. Um, so if you need to look at more examples, you can see those page numbers um, in this presentation. Okay, so reference list updates. Um, again, going with my theme, things are more streamlined um, than they have been in the previous edition. Um, the big change to book citations is that um, you don't have to list the publisher location anymore. Um, you're still listing the publisher, obviously, but you're not listing the city where the books were published. So to me, that's a welcome change. Um, one <laughs> change that perhaps unstreamlines, if that's a word, things is that now um, you are required to list up to 20 authors in your reference list. Uh, previously it was seven, now it's 20. Um, you know, I work mostly obviously with education um, research and there are rarely articles which have more than 20 authors in them. Um, but we were talking about this in the context of the sciences and that that is a definite possibility that you may have works that have 20 or more authors. Um, so that's one, one thing that is um, less streamlined than the previous edition. But uh, the way this works, is if you have more than 20 authors, you list the first 19 and then the last one, um, which is similar to the format that was used before, but just with a larger number of authors. 
Another change is the format for DOI. And again, if you have been um, keeping up with APA up to this point, um, you will know that when the sixth edition came out, they used this format up here at the top, the DOI colon um, with the alphanumeric string after that. Um, and then they switched sort of halfway through um, to this URL format. Um, and now they're saying don't use the old format anymore, only use this URL format. Um, the issue is that some articles, obviously, that were published before the um, URL format became popular um, still have the old version. And, um, you know, I can look at these two examples and see that they are the same article but I personally don't feel confident in my ability to transform one into the other. So there's a website called shortdoi.org that you can go and um, it will transform the old style DOI into the new style DOI for you. Um, so if you need assistance with that, if you're citing an article that has that older DOI format, um, it, will, it will do that for you. So that's very convenient. Um, the other thing is in a website citation, you no longer have to use the words retrieved from. Um, hopefully they have realized that we understand that that is where it was retrieved from. So you just don't have to use those words anymore. You just include the website um, link and not the words that go along with it. Um, one, of course, um, the last edition was from 2009, and so um, there are a lot of media that didn't exist in 2009 um, that exist currently. So the new edition does have examples for citing podcasts, social media, YouTube, all those sorts of things. Um, and of course, the APA style blog has um, been sort of updating APA style as we go um, to include those sorts of media that have come along in the last 10 years, but um, now they are included as part of the actual style guide itself. Okay, so the last thing that I want to talk about is um, inclusive and bias-free language. And um, this is actually something that APA has been working on since the 1970s. Um, I found an article yesterday that was, um, or a website yesterday that was talking about the updates from the 70s to APA style, um, in which they told people that, that it, they could no longer use ter terms like poetess and lady lawyer. Um, <laughs> So this is something that APA has been doing for a while. Um, and now they've taken it, you know, to, I guess, a new level in the seventh edition. Um, the actually has a really great uh, section of a chapter that I would recommend, it's chapter five in the APA style guide, um, that talks a lot about how to reduce bias and use inclusive language in research. So I just wanted to talk about a couple of things um, that are included in that, but I would strongly encourage you to read this chapter um, because it really gives you a lot to think about um, with regards to how we use language to describe people. Um, one thing is the use of the singular they pronoun. Um, so they say that they should be used for people who use the A as their pronoun. Um, but also for a single person whose gender is not known or irrelevant. So previously where we would have said perhaps he or she, um, now we use they in place of that. Um, also, you'll notice it's not just someone whose gender or whose pronouns are unknown, but also when gender is irrelevant. Um, so if you're doing a research study and you're tracking uh, people by age, gender doesn't matter, then refer to them by the singular they pronoun. Um, they do say to use them, their, theirs, and themselves 
Um, I have had questions myself in the past about using themselves because that's more singular uh, versus themselves. Um, they say either is acceptable, but they prefer themselves with the V over themselves. And again, um, that's to be used when someone uses they as their pronoun or if a gender, if gender is unknown or irrelevant, um, as opposed to using he or she, which reinforces the gender binary, which is no longer accepted. So um, sort of along those lines with using they, if gender is irrelevant, um, they, APA talks a lot about focusing on relevant characteristics um, and only using those that are important to your study. So if you're studying age, you know, maybe race doesn't matter, maybe socioeconomic status doesn't matter. Um, so focusing on those characteristics that are important to your research. Uh, they also talk about using um, descriptors when writing about gender identity. So referring to women as um, transgender women, cisgender women, transgender men, cisgender men, um, those sorts of descriptors. Um, also using country of origin when writing about racial or ethnic groups. So talking about, you know, being as specific as possible, um, like Japanese Americans as opposed to Asian Americans, because of course that encompasses a larger group of people. Um, also, and if you're, if you're in education or related human fields, um, people first language is probably not a new concept to you at all. Um, but, you know, people first language is acknowledging humanity. So using terms such as people who use drugs as opposed to drug users, people who are experiencing homelessness versus homeless people. Um, so really focusing on that uh, people first language and um, not defining someone by one characteristic. Um, there are examples or there are exceptions to this. Um, there are some groups who prefer identity first language, um, deaf, deaf people, um, and that's the big, the big D, deaf people who are, who identify as part of the deaf community, um, you know, they refer to themselves as, themselves as deaf people. Um, also, there are groups of um, autistic people who refer to themselves as autistic people. Um, so basically, it's just using the language that people use to refer to themselves. Um, but again, in many cases, um, using that people first language is more inclusive and acknowledges the humanity of all people. Um, again, this section of chapter five in the APA style guide goes into a lot of different um, ways of reducing bias. Um, one thing that it talks about with age especially is, you know, not talking about the elderly, um, you know, not you know, acknowledging that they're actually humans. Um, so, you know, older people, older adults people 65 and older, you know, people between 55 and 65, or using some sort of um, more specific term that involves actually people. Um, actually, the two examples that they use are the elderly and the gays, which I think are both terms that are very um, out of, hopefully, out of wide use at this point, um, but still important to know. Um, also, there's a large section about how to refer to people, um, indigenous people from around the world. So that's really helpful. There's a section on, um, you know, how to refer to Native Americans, um, Native Alaskans, Native Canadians, all those sorts of things. So um, it really, it helps. But basically, the, the thing to keep in mind is how do people return, refer to themselves and making sure that we are using um, the terms that the group itself would prefer. Um, let's see. Again, um, I mentioned socioeconomic status on here, but you know, making sure that you're focusing on um, the 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 
priorities that are the criteria that are, that are important to your research and um, avoiding terms with negative connotations such as you know the projects or um, you know talking about not saying using terms like welfare mothers which again is an example straight from here and using an example such as or mothers who receive temporary assistance for needy family benefits or something like that um, people experiencing homeless people in transitional housing instead of the homeless or homeless people um, they also talk about and just sort of acknowledge intersectionality which i think is really important um, so intersectionality is just you know the way that individuals are shaped by all the different um, cultural biological economic and social things that make up their identity so um, they do they address that as well and about how um, you know those sorts of identities interact with each other and um, again how it's important to make sure that you're identifying the parts of a person's identity that are relevant to your research so anyway i don't often recommend that people read part of a citation manual seems very strange to me but i would definitely recommend um, giving this section of it a read um, i will say actually so um, as you know there are some things happening uh, in our current environment that are changing the way that we do business and um, I learned the other day that um, Red Shelf, which is a, um, a website that provides electronic access to textbooks, they are providing free um, access to a lot of textbooks. Um, it's been really helpful for our students. We've, we've been able to find a lot of things, um, a lot of access to textbooks that students weren't able to access and print anymore um, and they have actually they're actually for now respond or they've actually provided access to the seventh edition of the APA style book um, for free through the end of May and um, so that's helpful I think through May 25th um, also so that's yeah so that's red shelf you have to register for an account to be able to use that um, we do have access to a product called academic writer and um, it used to be called apa style central and that is where you can go to get it's a database provided by apa it's basically the, the electronic version of their manual however it is still the sixth edition of APA, and we are yet to um, find out exactly when they are making the transition over to the seventh edition. Um, Leah, who is in here right now, um, reached out to them right when we got the seventh edition and asked when that would be, and I don't think that they ever gave a definitive answer about when that was gonna happen, um, but hopefully at some point they will update. Um, it seems like it's time to me. Um, also, Zotero does have the seventh edition as one of its citation styles you can use. And I've used it several times and I find it to be accurate as far as I can tell. Um, so I recommend that as a resource. Um, also several, um, several um, other you know, library websites have um, updated their information to the seventh edition as well. So um, there you go. So that's a quick overview of the seventh edition of APA. So if anybody has questions, I would be happy to answer them. Hey, Amy, there were a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I'm just going to shoot through making sure I'm starting at the beginning. Okay. Um, so someone, I don't know if this is, so my dissertation only have to include 20 references I think this person might be referring to the 20 authors, which is, of course, different than 20 references. I don't know if um, this person wants to clarify um, that. And then the next question is for websites, do we still have to put the date that information was retrieved? That is a great question. And again, as I said before, I'm going to refer to page 351 before I answer that question. 
So um, someone, um, while uh, she's looking for that, um, someone asked where the webinar will be posted. I'll start going over that in case people have to go since we're right at 1130. Uh, everyone who signed up for this, even if they're not here, will um, get a recording of this webinar through an email as well as an assessment form that I'm about to um, send out in the chat. So if y'all could uh, fill out the assessment forms, that's really helpful for us. And then um, uh, it's available also on a web page that I'm about to drop on here. All of our past sessions, uh, if you just found out about this webinar series, uh, is uh, on this page as well. So, Well, I'm trying to find it. Um, okay, so to answer your question, um, according to APA, it says, um, include a retrieval date only when the content is designed to change over time and the page is not archived. So, um, you know, perhaps like a news website uh, or a news story where they might update content um, that might be a, an occasion, but if it's just a, a regular website, it says you don't have to include that information. Um, so I guess that's sort of up to you, whether or not you believe that a website is relatively fixed in time or um, if, it, if it is likely to change. Um, let's see. Okay, well, so as people are leaving, sorry, my last thing is I did drop the assessment in the chat. I'll also send it out in the email if you don't have time to fill it out right now. I also linked to where the webinar recordings are, uncg.libguides.com slash webinars. This is a part of the research and application series. Um, Amy just dropped the APA style guide in there. And I also just want to say that there we did add in a webinar that we didn't used to have on there in um, on uh, researcher identity management, uh, which is going to be really relevant for anyone who's interested in looking at where to publish, citation metrics, open access publishing. Um, we'll mention all those things. Really, it's about creating profiles and thinking about how you um, create your researcher identity online. Um, so uh, I'm going to start going through the other questions now. Um, Assessment. So, um, someone, did, did you share the APA seventh book on redshelf.com? That's what I'm trying to find right now. That, okay, that so link that it. I just shared has a couple, has the link to Redshelf. Um, let's see, I'm trying to look it up right now. So before you do that, maybe we can get the other questions in case you'll have to leave. Sure. Um, and I can also look for it in the background. Um, but Heather asked, could we go over the in-text citation for same author, different titles? Yes. Okay. So, um, let's see. I'm trying to find it. Same author. I, I think, okay, I'm going to say something, but I probably shouldn't do that. I was going to try to find it really quick. Um, but typically, if it's the same author in different publications, as long as they're in different years, you're fine. You know, as long as it's, you know, one work is from 2005 and one is from 2007, the, the year is enough to distinguish between the different, um, the different works. Um, if there's two works from the same author published in the same year, then you'll typically do like 2007A, 2007B, um, and then you would match that both in, you know, in your in-text citation and in the reference list at the end. Does that make sense? Feel free to shoot me an email if you, um, if, if you want more yeah, help with and, that, but that's typically how it works. And again, it, in case people have to go, because I know it's past 1130, um, all library liaisons can help you with APA if that is your style that you use or whatever style you use. Um, so if you don't know who your liaison is, I'm happy to tell you in the chat as people are leaving. Um, again, I'm kinesiology, public health, education, and community and therapeutic rec. Amy is all of the School of Education plus Human Development and Family Studies. Um, Leah does all the um, health sciences that I didn't mention. So like nursing, nutrition, uh, the genetics counseling program. I know I'm missing some. 
um, and she's in here. But anyway, so the next question is, will the graduate school require seventh edition for dissertations being submitted this spring and summer? That depends on your program. I'll go ahead and answer that. Right, Amy? Yes. Um, so like, you know, like I would talk to your advisor or your program director. They'll give you pretty clear instructions on submitting your dissertation. Um, so including whether it's sixth or seventh. Um, a lot of people are switching over to seventh, uh, but some this whole semester have been using six, so I'm not sure about the dissertations. Um, okay. Where did I find the next question? There we go. Okay. So um, April asked, what's the actual title of the APA style seventh edition? I can't find it on Red Shelf. Um, so so it, is, it is called the Publication Manual of the American Psychological Association, um, but I also just pasted it in a link to the page where I searched for that. Um, you do have to create an account in order to borrow it, but it says you can borrow it through May 25th. So um, if you need it between now and then, it's definitely a good opportunity to get some free access. Um, I should probably create an account just to make sure it actually works. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, try, I did. I found it, but I, I and, but I couldn't um, find it for free. I found it. I could purchase it for $35.99, but I can't find it for free. Yeah, so you have to go through. So right now, like Amy mentioned, Red Shelf is doing a trial, like basically like we get temporary full access. So just you have to make sure you're going through the library website and not uh, like, okay, I didn't do that. like we have it set up, you know, through our proxies. So um, I'll try to look for that in the background already. Um, Leah also posted um, a blog post from the APA about the um, coronavirus response. So that's going to be really useful. Um, oh, okay. So April, that's your search. Thanks. Oh, Amy, is that the link? Yes. Okay. Let me, I'm just, I'm signing up for an account real quick. And then okay. uh, I have nine characters. Come on, y'all. So yeah, Leah mentioned that the liaisons are listed on library guides, if you don't know. And again, you can ask me in the chat um, and then see, uh, there's a link. And I'll try to, um, I'll include this link in the email. Um, so when you create an account and then verify your email, it works. So cool. Um, so I would go through that student response dot red shelf, create an account, verify your email, then you'll get the full um, guide, which is useful, especially as it seems like a lot of y'all are writing dissertations. Um, lots of citations in those. All right. Remember yep. if you're using Zotero, that Zotero is updated to seven and you can switch back and forth between six and seven too um, once you do the, you know, have it downloaded. Yes, that is very important and very yeah. helpful. Another, to me, helpful. another reason to um, to use Zotero. Yeah, if you're not using Zotero and you're in this uh, webinar and you're a graduate student, I would definitely recommend you look at it. I'm dropping the link in the guide. You can set up an appointment with your liaison um, at this point virtually, one-on-one -on -one, to have them help you get started. I have one with some faculty this afternoon, um, so uh, faculty and grad students, so um, we all can help. Um, and if your liaison can't help, they'll point you to someone who can. It's totally fine. So yeah, okay, well, we're right, we're almost at 1140. So I, um, again, if anyone has any other questions, um, please let us know. Remember that the assessments up there in the chat, um, I've dropped so many links in the chat, I'm not gonna do it again. I'll send it in the email um, with the recording as well. So thanks everyone for coming, um, Amy for hosting. Um, Thank you, thanks for coming y'all. Thank you, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Amy, I'm going to um, end the meeting. All right. Bye. Bye.